Well, tonight's, tonight's uh, speaker is Tom Banzak. He is a freshwater ecologist at the University of Montana's Flathead Lake Biological Station. He also uh, currently serves as the associate director. Um, he started at the uh, biological station uh, back in 1996 as a graduate student studying river ecology on the middle fork of the Flathead River. Tam, Tom has uh, since conducted ecological and water quality investigations around the northwestern Montana. Uh, he's led research activities on large, pristine salmon rivers in northern British Columbia and southeast Alaska. He's constructed environmental sensor networks and has been active in the battle against aquatic invasive species. I got to say that uh, this whole problem of invasive species is an underappreciated ecological problem around the world, and especially here in North America. So Tom is going to be talking about a, a very important uh, topic here. Uh, tonight he will talk about uh, flathead lake ecology in the context of the dramatic changes to flathead lakes food well due to introduced an invasive species and the role that fisheries management has played in this whole thing. The title of his uh, talk tonight is Shrimp, Salmon, and Trout, Invasive Chowder at Flathead Lake. <laughs> Tom? I got this one, and it works. Oftentimes, the hardest part of a talk is getting the technology dialed in. So thank you very much for the opportunity tonight. It's a real honor and privilege to be here to talk about something that I love talking about, which is Flathead Lake. And as David mentioned, I'm going to talk about the biological community changes that have happened due to um, the sometimes intentional arrival of invasive species. So, adjusting to this microphone on my face. I'm not sure if I feel like Britney Spears or Tony Robbins. But. <laughs> so there on the screen is the Flathead Lake Biological Station down in Yellow Bay. We're located about halfway in between Big Fork and Folsom. We've got 80 acres and about 60 buildings. We're part of the University of Montana. This is your biological station. And if you haven't had the opportunity to visit, I invite you to. We love showing people around uh, these days with COVID weirdness, we ask that people call in advance because we have a gate that's down, but um, you're certainly welcome. Walk around our grounds and learn about more about what we do. We do have some public events slated for this summer. We have an open house. We do a research cruise. We have a series of, of uh, speakers in starting in mid-June. Uh, we are the Sentinel of the Lake. We were founded in 1899. We're the second oldest biological station in the nation. It bothers us that we're second. <laughs> The oldest biological station is Ohio State University's Stone Lab, but we get to work on Flathead Lake and they have to work on Lake Erie. So I think we came out ahead in that. <laughs> the biological station has a threefold mission to advance research, education, and environmental monitoring. We're a world-renowned freshwater research facility, and people in the water sciences from around the planet know about us and know about our work. Um, people in Kalispell sometimes have heard about the biostation and wonder what goes on down there. But we've, our flagship programs are local, but we've worked on almost every continent. We actually have a faculty member, he spends the winters, our winters, down in Antarctica. And he studies the lakes that form above and below the ice in Antarctica. He scuba dives through ice in Antarctica. I'm a scuba diver, I've got no interest at all in that. He can have that. I like the colorful fish in the warm waters and getting back to the surface okay. Um, Education-wise, we have um, the K through 12 education program. We want every kid that grows up here in the Flathead watershed to learn about this incredible place and the critters that live in our waters. I try to hammer home with the young people that it's a really special thing to have abundant, clear, clean blue water in your backyard as your normal. Unfortunately, a lot of the waters in the world are degraded, they're murky, they're green, they're brown, or they're scarce. So having something like Flathead Lake, Whitefish Lake, Swan Lake, the Flathead River as, as our normal is pretty special. We try to, we try to get that point across. Uh, we also mentor graduate students year round, and we've been running summer classes since 1899. It's the longest um, program of its type that we know about. And the only times that we've shut down and canceled classes are World War II, and 2020 COVID. So it's kind of a historic era for us, but we're ramping back up for this season. 
We expect to be really busy. Most of our classes have wait lists and students come from around the nation. Only about a third of our students come from UM. And on a typical summer, we'll have students from 20 to 25 different universities in 20 to 25 states. And that's a really fun thing to have a melting pot and mixing pot of kids from different backgrounds, different ecologies, different socioeconomic um, backgrounds as well. All right. Got a little excited with my thumb there, but the biostation is located right there. Uh, Flathead Lake is the largest natural freshwater lake by surface area in the western US. There's a lot of premises in that statement because um, we have a sister lake, a smaller lake in California and Nevada that makes the same claim as we do. Lake Tahoe says that they're the exact same thing by volume. And so you have to say natural because man-made reservoirs like Fort Peck are bigger. You have to say freshwater because the Great Salt Lake is bigger. And then we have to say by surface area because Lake Tahoe makes the same claim. Um, Lake Tahoe is deeper. Lake Tahoe is over 1,500 feet deep. Flathead is a mere 400 feet deep. But if you look at us from above from space, we're the bigger lake. So that's what I'm going to go with. We're the bigger <laughs> lake. Flathead is the 79th largest lake in the world, and it's always exciting to crack the top 100 of anything. And um, of these large lakes, my long-term former boss, Jack Stanford, who retired a few years back, he used to say that of the large lakes in the world, um, we are one of the cleanest. And of the large lakes in the world with people living around it, we are absolutely the cleanest. A lot of the large lakes in the world are up in the far north. They're in Alaska, British Columbia, Russia, Siberia, where there aren't a lot of people yet. As you all know, hailing from these parts, the Flathead and Flathead Lake have world-renowned water quality and water clarity. Water clarity is how clear the water is. And uh, people literally come from around the world. Literally millions of people come from around the world every summer to clog up our roads and our hotels and restaurants to see what abundant, clear, clean blue water looks like. It's a really special treat for us to have that as our normal. And our little bio station down the, down the road from you here, we've got one of the best lake data sets in the world. And we've got information about the lake going back to 1899, but we really kicked it into gear in the 1970s when the lake was starting to show some, uh, uh, some problem signs, some warning signs, and there were some algae blooms of species that hadn't been documented to bloom before. And that's the value, that's one of the values of having a long-term place-based record at a biological station is you can look back in the records and say, this species hasn't shown up before, something's changing. And so in addition to the algae blooms of the 60s and 70s and the 1970s, large-scale coal mining was proposed in the Canadian portion of our watershed. The North Fork Flathead in southeastern British Columbia comes out of the East Kootenai coal fields. The southeastern British Columbia is made out of coal. About 40% of the world's steel making coal comes from within about a four to five hour drive from here. And in the 1970s, and then the 1980s, and then the 2000s, and probably in the 2030s, uh, Canada has had significant proposals to mine that coal to um, send to China for steel making coal. Fortunately, people at the time in this watershed got together and said, you know, we need a better scientific record of what's going on in the lake now, because after mining, this lake is going to be de de <clears throat> degraded. But fortunately, people got on both sides of the border got together and said, Flathead Lake is more valuable, both ecologically and economically, than 20 years of coal mining in Canada and the mines never happened. So instead of a before mining and after mining picture, we have this wonderful long-term record that we've kept going since 1977. And um, uh, some people have been on the project since the 1980s. So we've got this continuous uh, data set that is world-renowned scientifically and provides us societally the context to look at whether Flathead Lake is changing or not, getting better, getting worse, and all that. All right, so a few pictures here of the old-time monitoring. This is from the 1960s. This is from the 1980s when Flathead Lake used to freeze. So historically, Flathead Lake would freeze about once every decade. And the last time Flathead Lake froze entirely across is 1989, 1990, that winter. So something's different, whether you believe in climate change or not, something is different that is keeping Flathead Lake from freezing. We're out on the lake every month of the year. Uh, sometimes in the winter, it feels like we're the only ones out there. 
Sometimes we have celebrities join us for the sampling. Uh, we had to fire him. His uh, manual dexterity wasn't very good, and he kept messing things up. But we got him out there. And this is what we don't want to happen, right? We're used to clean, clear blue water. We're not used to green, murky algal blooms. And so a lot of the efforts of the state, federal, tribal agencies, and scientists in this watershed are, how do we keep that from happening? How do we keep Flathead Lake crystal clear and blue for us, for our kids, for our grandkids, um, and beyond? All right, I'm a scientist. I'm gonna throw you some graphs and some data. So. One of the ways that people measure water quality is with this device here called a Secchi disc. It's basically a ceramic plate. It's one of the oldest continuously used scientific instruments in the world. The Pope's oceanographer invented this during the Enlightenment or something like that. <laughs> Literally. I think his name was Secchi, because if you're a scientist and you invent something, of course you name it after yourself. Um, but you lower this disc down into the water and until you can't see it anymore. And then basically you measure the, the rope or the cable that it's on as you pull it back up. And that depth is an indicator of how clear the water is. So on this graph, the deeper into, you know, from zero down, so these measurements show 18 meters deep, you could still see that dinner plate down in the water. And so there's a lot of variability and a lot of scatter here, but those of you who, um, ever look at the lake or the river during the spring, understand that spring runoff brings a lot of sediment and cloudy, um, cloudy, murky water. That's natural. That's fine. So there's a lot of natural variability due to what time of the year it is, what runoff's like. But there's something really cool about this graph. And that's that there's no trend. Most of the waters of this planet are getting murkier and you can't see as deeply into them anymore. But Flathead Lake is as clear today as it was in 1977 when the data on this graph starts. We use our Flathead Lake data all the time to engage global lake comparison studies or national lake comparison studies. And Flathead Lake continues to be this weird outlier. It's not getting warmer, it's not getting cloudier, it's not getting more polluted, and it's a real, you know, it's, it's a joy to be able to say that to, to people that live here and love this place like I do. Because most lakes, and this is Lake Tahoe, most lakes, the depth into which you can see the water is declining. So it's shallower secchi depth. So Flathead's doing great from that standpoint. All right, so keeping your finger on the pulse of an ecosystem you care about is really important. And so the Biostation has this long-term monitoring record on Flathead Lake. We work with a lot of partners, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. The biological station is on the Flathead Reservation and the ancestral home of the Kootenai, Kalispell, and um, Bitterroot Salish people. We work with nonprofits like the Flathead Lakers, and this is the Open Water Swimmers Club that are so crazy that they swim the length and across Flathead Lake. Uh, we also work on Whitefish Lake and Swan Lakes. On Whitefish Lake, we work with Whitefish Lake Institute, and on Swan, we work with the Swan Lakers to continue to monitor, to get information and data on which management decisions can be made. Our managers and our politicians, we want them to have the best available information when they're making the decisions that influence these ecosystems that we care about. Doesn't mean that they always make the best decisions, but they have the information and the opportunity to make the best decisions. Uh, we also have a long record of working in Glacier Park, and we're actually starting up some monitoring in Lake McDonald for the Park Service um, this coming year. Lake McDonald starting to show some stressing and some water quality issues potentially related to the fires and all the nutrients that come in with fires, and also potentially due to some aging septic systems around the lake that uh, input nutrients. And then a couple of years ago, we started a philanthropically funded program called Monitoring Montana Waters, and we provide scientific expertise and uh, laboratory analyses to on the ground watershed groups across the state of Montana. Uh, the state agencies don't do any monitoring anymore. They step back and wash their hands at that about a decade ago, saying it was too expensive and too challenging. They put the impetus on the ground on the people that live in these places. And so the biostation is able to step in and 
set up a, a monitoring program that makes scientific sense, train the people so that they're not contaminating samples, we run the analyses, and then we help them provide the data to the state so that the state can make informed decisions on waters across Montana. All right. Again, there's the biological station. And I know that you all turn to your local ecologist for your information about economics and finances. <laughs> but it's really important. These, this, sorry, uh, this slide that I'm about to show you, I give lots of presentations, chambers of commerce, rotary clubs, anyone who listened. And this slide often gets the most questions and the most conversation because everyone has a pocketbook. Whether you enjoy water, whether you swim, fish, have a lake home, everyone's got a pocketbook. So we have a natural resource economist on our team, Nanette Nelson, and she and a woman from Lori Curtis from Whitefish Lake Institute last year completed an economic study about the benefits that healthy, clean water of our lakes bring to the real estate in the area. And they showed that um, uh, local property values are two to three billion dollars higher because of the high water clarity and quality of Flathead Lake and Whitefish Lake in particular. Two to three billion dollars, that's not chump change. That's real money that gets the attention of our politicians and our county commissioners and tax assessors. So as goes Flathead Lake, so goes the entire Flathead. Um, around here, about a quarter of our economy is tourism and non-resident spending. As I mentioned earlier in the summer, it feels like more than a quarter, but um, Flathead and Lake Counties both. And interestingly, I've looked at data from 2007 and 2016, and it's been about 20 to 25% throughout that entire period. So this is not a passing thing. This is a, a long-term stable economic driver of our region. And University of Montana did some research and it showed that um, eight of the nine top reasons that people come and visit Montana have to do with natural resources. So having a healthy, healthy ecosystems here, having the opportunity to see what clean, clear blue water looks like, to go into the Bob Marshall Wilderness, to go to Glacier Park, that's driving our economic prosperity here in this reason. It's our golden goose. Because unfortunately, globally, there's all kinds of examples that ecological degradation corresponds to economic decline. So if we let Flathead Lake decline, this prosperity that we're seeing here could decline as well. <coughs> There's a couple of examples to share with you. One's from Lake Champlain. University of Vermont did a study a few years back looking using that Secchi disc that I talked about, showing that when the water clarity of Lake Champlain decreases, that decreased tourism re revenue and decreased property values followed. And um, in some cases, rental lake cabin property values decreased by almost 40% when the lake got muddier and you couldn't see as clearly into it. 40% is huge. 40% of $2 billion is even huger. So again, this is an economic and study showing it's in our best interest to protect the water clarity and quality of Flathead Lake. The other major threat to all of our waters are aquatic invasive species. And there's a number of studies I cite here that show that when you get a new aquatic invader to a lake, that property values can, can decrease by almost 20%. If you get a new invader like these mussels that, that you've hopefully heard about, um, it, the shoreline becomes less enjoyable and market forces take over and the price that people are willing to pay goes down. So yeah, if we got mussels here, property values could decrease by 20%. 20% of $3 billion is a really big idea. I think you're getting my take home message, which is it's in our economic best interest to protect these ecosystems that we love about around here. And as I mentioned, we've got a natural resource economist. She did a project for the state looking at um, what the economic damages to the state of Montana would be if mussels were widespread in Montana. And her calculation showed that it could be over $200 million a year in lost tourism revenue and mitigation costs. That doesn't include property values, but over $200 million a year could be a decrease to Montana's economy. And she did a, it was the first study that she'd done that of this type that had been done in the West. Since then, she's done a similar study for South Dakota, and now she's working on one for Kansas. So this economic rationale resonates with our elected officials and our business leaders. That's why we're involved, even though I'm a river ecologist. 
All right, so I mentioned these reports. I have um, kind of one pagers on them and a bunch of information in the table over there. As I mentioned, this $200 million, $234 million loss estimate does not include decreases to property values. Interestingly, she did these property valuations before this huge explosion. I recently, the Wall Street Journal was featuring the Flathead recently, talking about how lakefront properties have doubled in value in the last two years. So that $3 billion value is old news already. It's four or five billion now. All right. So the story you wanted to hear today is shrimp, salmon, trout, invasive chowder, and flathead lake. All right. So I'm an ecologist, not, not an artist. So this is flathead lake. And there's a few graphs or figures like this, so I need to explain to you how they work. So this is Flathead Lake. The fish icons, the size of them indicates the abundance, not the actual size of the fish. So this is some of Elrod's data, sorry, Biostation Founders data from the early 1900s. Peamouth chub, a little feeder fish, used to be the most abundant fish in Flathead Lake. Northern pike minnow, bull trout, West Slope cutthroat trout, a couple species of sucker, and mountain whitefish is our native whitefish. So the size of the icon indicates its abundance, and then the location where you find it is roughly where that fish species likes to live. So West Slope cutthroat trout, they tend to be on the surface, feed on the surface. Our native top predator, bull trout, is an ambush predator coming up from the depths from below. So this is the historical fish community of Flathead Lake when people of European descent first arrived in this area. So, and then these are the fish food. These are the little zooplankton that live in the lake. So Flathead Lake historically only had eight to 10 species of fish. And eight to 10 species of fish in a lake the size of Flathead isn't a lot of species. A lake the size of Flathead in the southeastern US that hasn't been glaciated might be 30 species of fish. A lake the size of Flathead in the tropics might have 300 species of fish. So when the early fisheries managers arrived to Flathead Lake, saw eight to 10 species of fish, they said, we can do better than that. But it makes sense if you think about it because Flathead Lake 15,000 years ago was ice and it's hard to make a living in ice as a fish. And so it's only been a short period of time for fish to make their way back to Flathead Lake and 15,000 years isn't long enough for new species to develop. But when the first fisheries managers got here and they were people of their time, they saw potential. They saw potential to increase the fish diversity of the lake, to provide more angling opportunities. And so they stocked everything you can think of in the Flathead Lake, including the kitchen sink. Between 1890 and 1950, over 30 species of fish were introduced into Flathead Lake. So on the left here, these are the historic native fishes of Flathead Lake. And these are the ones of that 30 that took. They're the ones that have self-sustaining populations um, and in the parentheses, you see the years that were introduced. So there's a lot of old years back then. So, you know, brook trout in 1913, rainbow trout 1914. So the early era of the flathead was bring the fish that people like catching and eating from other parts of the country and introduce them to Flathead Lake and see how they do. Rainbow trout are from California, Washington, Oregon, the Pacific. Brook trout are from the mountains of the Northeast. Um, bass are from the southeast, pike are from the midwest. And so these are the species that were introduced to make things better that now have reproducing populations. A couple of takeaways from this slide is one, the native list today is shorter than the non-native list. So in terms of just species richness or diversity, the non-native fishes are winning in Flathead Lake today. And then these three fishes here, lake trout, whitefish, and yellow perch, the, in red, those are the most abundant species in the lake today. So the non-natives are winning in terms of sheer numbers as well. Lake trout and lake whitefish both were introduced in the early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s from Lake Superior, from the Great Lakes. All right, so after this era of stocking, we have a, another graphic of Flathead Lake, and you can see it's a little bit more crowded. And this is data from the early 1980s. We still have the Peamouth Chub and the West Slope Cutthroat, but there's a little bit infill here. We've got yellow perch. We've got lake whitefish from Lake Superior, not our native whitefish. And we've got lake trout as well. 
And then I want to call attention to this. This is kokanee salmon. Kokanee salmon is a landlocked sockeye salmon. And um, the life cycle of Pacific salmon is you are born in freshwater, typically. You go out to the ocean when you're a year or two old, you know, when you're a few inches long. You live out in the ocean for several years, depending on your species, where there's abundant rich food resources. You grow gigantic, and then you swim back to your home stream where you were born after a certain period of time. Um, this is a sockeye salmon, but one of their cousins, the king salmon or Chinook salmon, they leave their natal home stream when they're two inches long. They come back when they're over 100 pounds after four or five years. So it's a dramatic and effective life history strategy to go where there's a bunch of food. And then you come back to where you were born and you lay your eggs or fertilize your eggs, uh, your partner's eggs, then you die and you feed your kids with your decomposing carcass. It's the ultimate parental sacrifice. Any of you who have kids know all about it. <laughs> but here in Flathead Lake, these salmon had no access to the ocean. Even before the dams or big waterfalls near the Montana-Idaho border that prevented upstream migration of the returning salmon. Uh, there are salmon that still make it up into Idaho in the Clearwater system in particular, the Salmon River, go figure, uh, but not into the Flathead system. So here in the Flathead, they used Flathead Lake as their ocean, and then they would travel upstream to reproduce. And some of the places they would reproduce included um, uh, McDonald Creek in Glacier National Park near Apgar. And I'm seeing some nodding, so uh, some of you, I hope, got to witness the absolute spectacle that was the salmon run in Glacier Park. So historically, there were hundreds of thousands of salmon in Flathead Lake that would run upstream into the, into the river system to reproduce in the fall. And as I mentioned, one of the places that they would reproduce was in McDonald Creek near Apgar. And as these salmon would run in the creek, you know, McDonald Creek might be the width of half of this room and might be waist deep you'd have 100,000 salmon in the fall in this one little creek. Well, we love salmon. Salmon are delicious. Uh, the anglers loved salmon. The limit was something like 30 a day. Salmon, you can barbecue them, you can fillet them, you can can them, you can smoke them. People would come from around the Northwest with freezers mounted on flatbed trucks to literally put up food for the winter. Well, that's, our, that's how it appeals to us. But the wildlife community keyed in on it as well. And there are some big furry creatures in this area that are particularly hungry for um, calories and fat in the fall. And so bears from the glacier and Bob Marshall area would come down to feed on the salmon and then bald eagles would as well. And at that time during this kokanee era, I've been told, um, the highest concentrations of bald eagles outside of Alaska were congregating in Glacier Park along McDonald Creek. And so it was an internationally known wildlife spectacle. It was Alaska in Montana. Well, what do you do if you have this? Well, you get a tourist destination. And so Glacier, before Glacier was full all the time, there used to be a summer bump and there used to be a fall bump. And you have, um, camera toting tourists from around the world, Europeans wearing neon with $10,000 lenses waiting to get that picture of the bear with the salmon because Alaska is a lot further than Montana. Well, what do you do if you're in charge of managing this internationally known wildlife spectacle and desired fishery? Well, you try to make it better, of course. That is a native zooplankton, that's a Daphnia. It's about the size of the point of a pencil. And that is the salmon food. That is a mysis shrimp. The shrimp evolved in the Great Lakes and the Canadian Shield area of South Central Canada. They get to be about an inch long. And so fisheries managers in the 50s, 60s, and 70s around the West intentionally introduced these shrimp to water bodies under the premise that a larger food package would grow you bigger, more, and better fish. I recently read a review article in one of the fisheries scientific journals of fisheries managers from the West wishing that they had never heard of mysis shrimp because they're everywhere and they've changed things so dramatically. Well, here in Flathead Lake, the idea was if we give these salmon a much bigger abundant food package, we'll have more salmon and they'll be even bigger. 
north of us in Kootenai Lake in British Columbia. They had the world record kokanee salmon, and we wanted some of that. They also had the mysa shrimp there. So our managers thought, if we get the shrimp, maybe we'll get bigger salmon as well. Well, it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> Turns out that the shrimp eat the salmon food. Also turns out that the salmon feed on the surface during the day and the shrimp spend all day on the bottom. So the shrimp was never available to the salmon as a food source. And then at night, the shrimp come up from the bottom and ate all the salmon food. So it was this double whammy for the salmon. Hundreds of thousands of them, the shrimp arrived and the community changed dramatically because the salmon never had access to the shrimp as a food source, and the shrimp ended up being a direct competitor with the salmon for the same food source. Salmon are visual feeders up near the surface during the day. That's what they keyed in on. And during the day, the shrimp was not available. All right, so going back as far as 1983, newspaper article said that the arrival of the shrimp in Flathead Lake could endanger the salmon. This was a biostation graduate student at the time. All right, another graph. Scientist here. We've got dates on this axis, abundance on this one. The kind of tan or salmon color salmon bar would be the kokanee salmon in McDonald Creek alone. So times a thousand. So McDonald Creek alone, some years would have 100, 120,000 fish in a stream the width of this room. Pretty incredible spectacle. Because of the salmon, the eagles would congregate and they would. Um, feed on the salmon. And then the red line, that is the mysis shrimp. So officially, the state fish, wildlife, and parks never put shrimp into Flathead Lake directly, but they introduced them to five or six different lakes around the basin, in particular in Swan Lake in 1977 or 1978. Well, Swan Lake is upstream from Flathead, 15, 20 miles water and things move downstream. <laughs> and so our monitoring program, which was put in place in 1977, primarily for the water quality information, in 1983 first captured mysis shrimp in Flathead Lake. It was an uh-oh moment, you can see from the uh, newspaper. And then the shrimp really exploded. And this is a very common pattern for the arrival of a new invasive species. They show up in small numbers, there's lots of food for them. There's no diseases from their home ecosystem to keep them in check. And nothing is keyed in on them as a food source yet. And so the population explodes and then it drops back down to a medium level for the longer term after they've literally eaten themselves out of house and home. Well, um, this one shrimp arrived and we call this a trophic cascade. This is literally a scientific uh, a very famous scientific paper, and it's literally a textbook example of, oops, good intentions gone awry. In 1984, there were over 300,000 salmon in Flathead Lake. By 1987, there were zero. Total population crash, total, oops, that wasn't supposed to happen due to an intentional management action by um, management agency. So total collapse, lost the salmon. Then the eagles started going elsewhere. The eagles found out that there was a, a rainbow trout run over in Canyon Ferry in the fall. So they all started going to Canyon Ferry instead. All right, so the mice of shrimp, they are here to stay. No one has ever gotten rid of them from any water body. Uh, Lake Ponderé downstream from us, they did a commercial harvest for aquarium fish food to see if they could knock the numbers down. They made money, they caught lots of them, didn't even put a dent in the numbers. So there's no known technology or way to get rid of the mysis shrimp. We go out and sample them. Uh, we've got a long-term record of once a year. We go out at night. We go out in the fall new moon, because I mentioned they vertically migrate from the bottom of the lake up to the top. More of them come up towards the top on the darkest nights of the year. So for us to do our annual censusing, we go out during the September, typically the September new moon. Can't use regular light, so that's why it's all red there. And here's our data. It's a continuation of what I showed you. You know, you got that first explosion, then they eat themselves out of house and home, then they drop back down, and then 
they fluctuate around kind of a medium level ever since. Now think about this, this is mysis per square meter of the lake. Each square meter, each of, you know, of these floor tiles, if you look down from above, there could be anywhere from you know, 40 to over 100 of the shrimp. Square meters, Flathead Lake is 100 plus thousand acres. And I can't even do the math between metric and imperial for you, but it's a lot of square meters and a lot of mysis shrimp. All right, so the mysis shrimp arrived and they started eating the native zooplankton, the, the fish food, and they affected the community below them. They are predatory and they eat those little animals. And so the biostation had some data from the 1970s before the shrimp arrived showing that of the zooplankton, the little fish food, each liter of water would have 60 to 70 of them, maybe more. When the shrimp arrived and started eating them, it dropped down to, you know, below 30 and maybe the long term is, you know, 35 or so. So about half of the zooplankton are available today that were here before the mysis shrimp. That impacts our native fish community that feed on the native zooplankton and keyed in on those particular species. In addition to that, before the mysis shrimp were arrived, had arrived, the zooplankton were large and nutritious and tasty. Doesn't that look good? And the shrimp ate the good stuff and left us behind with the smaller, more protected, sometimes chemically defended um, uh, invertebrates. So the uh, quantity of food decreased after the shrimp arrived and the quality did as well. So a total change in the community downward as well. All right, so looking at the fish community before and after mysis, the native fishes before mysis and gray were very abundant in the historic data. After the shrimp arrived, the natives declined dramatically, and the non-natives, the exotic or the invasives, they were around, but they really exploded after the shrimp arrived. Well, why? Well, the dominant fish species today are lake trout and lake whitefish. Both of them evolved in the Great Lakes with mysis shrimp. Both of them were introduced into Flathead Lake in the early 1900s or so, and they live in a deep, dark bottom where historically there wasn't a lot of food for them. Well, in the 1980s, you bring them their favorite food and their populations just explode. The juveniles that live on the bottom no longer had a bottleneck for their population to become adults. And literally, you bring their favorite food into the ecosystem and the non-natives just took off. So the arrival of this one little shrimp you know, changed the zooplankton community, changed the eagles and the bears and Glacier Park, changed the zooplankton, changed everything. One introduced species. So here's Flathead Lake today, the modern era. You can see um, Lake Whitefish is now the most abundant fish in Flathead Lake. Last numbers I saw is about 2 million of them. Lake Trout is now the top predator. Last number I saw is about a million of them. And our native bull trout, there's less than 20,000 of them left in Flathead Lake. All of this occurring since the arrival of the shrimp in the 1980s. Lake Whitefish lives in the deep dark bottom its whole life, feeds on invertebrates. When their favorite food showed up, they just took off. Lake trout, when they're juveniles, they live in the bottom feeding on invertebrates, but then when they become adults, they become voracious predators. They are piscivores. I call them lake sharks. They can eat a fish up to two thirds of their own body size without chewing. So if we were lake trout, someone in here could eat somebody else without chewing. It wouldn't be pretty, but it'd be possible. <laughs> I call them the Triumvirate of Terror because these three species from the Great Lakes now dominate Flathead Lake. In essence, through, in most cases, intentional species introductions, we converted a Rocky Mountain Lake into a Great Lake. Interestingly, the Great Lakes often fund research here in Flathead Lake so that they can learn about the species that they've lost in the Great Lakes because they've had their own wave after wave of introductions that have changed the food web there dramatically to um, lose the species that they've gifted to us. All right, so here's another graph that continues where we left off, right? We saw the mysis explode and drop off. We saw the eagles and the, and the kokanee drop off. So mysis continues in this magenta color. 
Bull trout in green were historically more abundant and they have declined over time to a lower new level. And then yellow is the lake trout. You barely see them before mice and shrimp, and now they've really taken over. They're the dominant top predator of the lake. So from 1990 until 2000, the state continued to stock kokanee salmon to bring this population back. People were pissed. People loved the salmon. They were delicious, and they lost them. So the state spent a million dollars a year for a 10-year period to grow baby salmon in hatcheries, fish factories, and then they would release them so into the lake so that they could grow up and become the adult fish that people had missed. One of the places they would release the baby salmon was Yellow Bay State Park, which is adjacent to the bio station. It's actually our property managed for public enjoyment right next to the bio station. And it wasn't me, but some of our researchers caught during the release of the baby salmon, they caught lake trout with distended bellies and tails sticking out of their mouths. Literally lake trout that couldn't fit another baby salmon into their gullet. So while we, society, were trying to bring back the salmon, little did we know it was actually a subsidized feeding program for the lake trout. <laughs> During that 10 year period, million dollars a year, $10 million, three salmon were caught by anglers. So again, I'm not the economist here, but I can divide by three. That's $3.3 million per fish caught. Not a great investment by my standard. Unfortunately, in lakes where there's this combination of the shrimp and lake trout and bull trout and kokanee, this is what happens. The shrimp and the lake trout take over. Sometimes uh, it appears irreversibly. All right, well, you guys love birds, so I've got a token bird slide here. I am a huge osprey fan myself. Love watching them fish. I can see them from my office, hitting the surface of the water. Uh, the biostation has a long history of osprey research. In particular, we had a couple of graduate students at the station in the 1960s and 70s, the McCarter twins or the osprey twins. And they started their work when DDT was still being used. And they finished their work after DDT had been banned. And they showed the dramatic recovery of osprey in Montana after the elimination of DDT. We had a graduate student uh, revisit some of their work in the early 2000s. And so the, the community change of the fishes dramatically influenced what the osprey were feeding on. And so here we've got cutthroat trout and bull trout and mountain whitefish are native species. And that red sliver after the community change in the mysis shrimp is totally gone. Lake trout here in blue was not found in the diets of the osprey at all back in the 60s and 70s. Becomes, you know, almost a quarter, you know, maybe 20% of the, of the pie chart. And then northern pike minnow. Northern pike minnow really became a much larger member of, or larger food source. Northern pike minnow tend to swim near the surface. Um, so they're more accessible. And that's large scale sucker. I don't really know the dynamics of why. So uh, large scale suckers made such a high, high proportion of the osprey food back then and, and why it shrunk. But um, you can see the change. You know, the, the lake trout are a much bigger portion of their diet. And those native fishes that we talked about are essentially invisible to the osprey today. We did look into whether this change in the food community, the opportunities for the osprey resulted in a decline of the osprey themselves or a decline of the um, uh, survivorship of the chicks, and it didn't. So it seems like osprey have been able to switch gears and still the numbers are high, and the nesting and um, reproductive success is still really high. So that's good news. And it kind of shows the adaptability of, um, of a species, a native species that's out there. All right, back to fishing. Um, so historically, bull trout were our native top predator, and um, the, confeder the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes that manage the south half of the lake have long historical and cultural ties to the bull trout. From a management perspective, they would like to bring the bull trout back, and federal agencies, scientists, tribal scientists, um, all believe that if there's a million hungry mounds out there of lake trout, the main way to help the bull trout come back is to knock back some of those um, some of those lake trout. 
The state, which manages the north half of the lake, has been cultivating a trophy lake trout fishery for 20 plus years. So we've got one water body with agencies managing in opposite directions, and there's no fence, and the fish don't know where they are. So it's kind of an interesting um, discussion between the different agencies that have management jurisdiction. And for many, many years, the, the tribes and the state would have, a, they had a co-management agreement, they'd have meetings at the station, we'd provide the scientific information to help them make their decisions. And basically they have agreed to disagree and we'd be there trying to tell mom and dad to stop fighting. But um, FWP wants to continue to have this large fish as an angling opportunity for members of the public or for visitors. And the tribes wanna bring back the top predator that they, um, uh, have fished for eons and generations. So the tribes have, under, uh, have embarked upon significant lake trout removal programs. Um, they are doing large-scale commercial gill netting to remove lake trout from the lake. Um, if there's one thing that we've learned is that people can overfish what they want to catch and eat. And so the tribes reached out to anglers, uh, commercial fishermen from the Great Lakes and kind of learned the techniques for um, capturing the, uh, the lake trout. They use a monofilament mesh, mesh called a gill net. The fish go partway through and then they can't get back out. So it's a lethal capture technique. And the tribes, gosh, it's all a blur now, maybe last 10 years seven years, they've been out there regularly catching and removing as many of the lake trout as they can. Another angling, or sorry, another lake trout removal uh, technique is fishing derbies. And using angler pressure is a long-standing technique, and the tribes have $225,000 worth of prize money out there for people to incentivize people to catch and kill as many lake trout as possible. They've got prizes for the most fish caught. They've got prizes for the smallest fish caught, the largest fish caught, the largest fish caught by the smallest person, the smallest fish caught by the largest person, <laughs> the largest number of fish caught by the youngest person, you name it. There are individual lake trout out there that have tags in them that if you catch that fish, you win $10,000. There are people that spend all spring out there catching fish after fish after fish because, um, because of the prizes. After looking at the data from, you know, it's spring Mac days, I think in the fall it's Mac attack. Uh, the state and the tribes used to run these programs together. The state has since dropped out and the tribes run them now. And um, the tribes looked at the data after, again, I don't know how many years, maybe 10 years of doing the fishing derbies and said, this is working, but it's not working well enough. And that's when they moved to the um, commercial gill netting, the commercial harvest. Actually, I was at the bio station today and they were netting just outside Yellow Bay just this morning when I was out there. I mentioned Yellow Bay State Park is right next to the bio station. On March 16th, on March 15th, on March 14th, there wasn't a single boat there, not a single trailer. It went to work on March 17th. It was all full and people were parked on the highway. So Mac Days really does incentivize and get people out there fishing to catch these species that the tribes want to remove through any means possible. The fish that the tribes catch, many of them are processed in Blue Bay. They are filleted, they are cleaned, they are frozen, and they're sold. So native fish keepers, is catching these lake trout and lake whitefish as well and they sell them and it's going really well for them they sell them at the university of montana's commissary they sell them at msu where they're prepared they sell them in restaurants in new york city and chicago a wild caught fish that um, you know, catching them has ecological benefits we love to feed them to groups that stay at the station so that they can be part of the solution to an aquatic invasive species problem. They have a variety of um, uh, recipes on their website as well. Now, interestingly, yes. Yeah, they're for sale. Um, as a distributor up in, in Whitefish sells them. I, but 
Native, if you go to the Native Fish Keepers website, we've also just driven to uh, Blue Bay and bought them directly from the fish processing plant. But they sell them to a middle a middle person who I, you, I've seen them in the grocery stores before, so they are out there. All right, so aquatic invasive species are a big problem globally. And as I mentioned, humans are really good at reducing the numbers of things that taste good. And so there's a movement out there to use our culinary preferences to knock back the unwanted species. So eat the invaders or invasivore.com. There's a variety of different locations where you can find information you know, on how to make your American bullfrog leg piccata. <laughs> The Chinese mystery snail, ceviche, uh, Jamaican jerk carp. Um, there are really high-end um, chefs that are out there experimenting with these undesired foods. Lionfish in the Caribbean, in particular, are wreaking havoc. Well, if you go to the Caribbean, there's these wonderful meals prepared made out of lionfish. This is one of my favorite things. I don't know about that, but Kentucky tuna. So the Asian carp are a big problem. If you have not heard of them, you should Google Asian jumping carp and then watch the videos. It is remarkable. So in the, in the Midwest and kind of Southeast, these, there's four species of carp that came from Asia. They were brought here intentionally to um, clean up aquaculture ponds. And then they escaped during the big Mississippi floods of like 92 when they got into the main Mississippi River system. And when they are disturbed by motorboats, they start jumping. And some of these carp can be 10, 15 pounds, and they break people's noses in motorboats. They knock water skiers out. So certainly, you should seriously Google Asian jumping carp because they have contests now to catch and kill as many. They, they bow hunt for them. <laughs> People water skiing with swords and battle axes. It's, it's great Midwestern fun. <laughs> You're laughing because you think I'm joking, but I'm not. So Kentucky tuna was a way to appeal to chefs and consumers because, you know what, these Asian carp, they don't taste very bad. In fact, they can be quite good, but carp has a stigma, right? It's a bottom feeder, it eats mud, it's a dirty fish, no one wants to eat a carp, giant goldfish, yuck. Um, so they rebranded them as Kentucky tuna and started to um, get them into supermarkets and get them into fancy restaurants until the Tuna Fishermen's Association sued them for you know, blasphemy or, or whatever. And the Tuna Fishermen won because calling carp Kentucky tuna was defaming the high standing reputation of tuna around the world. So I'm glad the tuna have lawyers to defend themselves from such an egregious idea as Kentucky tuna for Asian carp. Everyone wants to eat a giant swamp rat, right? So, you know, some, some New, New Orleans jambalaya of a, of a big nutria. Nutria are a, like, they're like a mega muskrat from the Amazon, basically. And they have them in eastern Washington, and they're coming this way, so watch for them. And they're tasty. And they're tasty, yep. So it could be a good thing. All right, Glacier National Park. One of my favorite places on the planet, probably the same for many of you. Or many of you. I moved to the Flathead in 1996 to start my master's. When I moved here in 1996, Glacier Park was a stronghold of native fishes. And in the west side of Glacier Park, there are you know, 10 or 12 lakes that are connected to the river system that fish can travel to. Our Flathead Lake lake trout don't stay in Flathead Lake, and they don't stay in lakes. It's unfortunate. Um, especially when the lake is so crowded with their, their cousins and so forth. So they go wandering up through the river system. Flathead Lake lake trout have been found all the way up into Canada. Flathead Lake lake trout have been found way up the Middle Fork river system. Flathead Lake lake trout have gone exploring to find new feeding and uh, living opportunities. And unfortunately, in my short time here in the Flathead, Glacier Park has gone from a stronghold of native trout to being dominated by lake trout. So all these in blue now are dominated by lake trout populations, just in you know, the blink of, of my memory's eye. Um, 
Kintla Lake and Logging Lake, the U.S. Geological Survey, which is the scientific arm of the federal government that works in the park, they have been working with the park to remove and catch and kill and remove as many lake trout as possible. They've been gill netting. They've been um, doing everything they can to remove these non-native lake trout to give the bull trout a chance. Yellowstone Lake. Yellowstone Lake down in Yellowstone has also been invaded by non-native lake trout. And um, the Park Service has been netting to remove the lake trout for over a decade, trying to get rid of as many as possible. Swan Lake, upstream from Flathead Lake, the state, the Fish and Wildlife Service, have been netting and harvesting and removing as many lake trout as possible from that lake to give the native species a chance. And downstream in Flathead Lake, they're managing for trophy lake trout fisheries. So to me, it doesn't make a ton of logical sense to have these contradictory management goals in waters that are so close to each other. And you know, to me, it's not really a biological problem, it's a societal values problem. But here in Glacier, we're trying to get rid of the lake trout. And in Flathead Lake, they're trying to grow the big lunkers so that the handful of fishing guides have, have jobs. <laughs> All right. Yes. So the red, the red ones for for the bull trout, the things that bull trout populations. Mm -hmm. Those are primarily bull trout, or there any lake trout in those? There would be no lake trout in those lakes. In many cases, there's some type of barrier, like a small waterfall, that keeps the non-natives from getting up there. Hungry Horse Dam is an incredible barrier to protect the South Fork Flathead from invading fishes. The, South Fork, the Upper South Fork is the last part of the Flathead that still has the native fish community intact, ironically because of hungry horse. So fisheries managers today no longer introduce non-native species into what we call open water bodies where they can spread. You know, hindsight's 2020, societal values have changed, a new crop of fisheries managers are looking out for the natives. Unfortunately, the general public has now taken it upon themselves to move non-native fishes around. Um, we call it bucket biology, we call it Johnny Applefish, we call it a felony because it is. And so these are just a few recent illegal introductions that have been discovered in western Montana. Region 1 of northwest Montana, the flathead up to Libya and so forth, um, has more illegal fish introductions than the rest of the state combined. We have an illegal fish introduction problem here. I've never really had an answer to this, but part of it, I think, is we've got more waters, we've got more lakes, we've got a lot of people coming from other places that want to bring their favorite fishes with them. So the most recent one is Swan Lake, where walleye were discovered. Walleye are a predatory, flaky white fish that's delicious. People absolutely love to fish for them, but they're not native, and they shouldn't be in Swan Lake. During some routine monitoring, the state discovered them in Swan Lake for the first time in 2015. They discovered that they were all immature, which is good. They hadn't reproduced. And then they, um, fish have an ear bone called an otolith that accumulates the chemicals of the places where they grow up. And the state did analysis on the um, ear bones of the fish and discovered that the Swan Lake fishes had grown up in Lake Helena. So some angler who lives in Helena that maybe has a Swan Lake lake home or likes fishing in Swan Lake wanted to make Swan Lake better and brought some buckets full of walleye into Swan Lake in 2015. As far as we know, there's not a reproducing population there. That's great news. As far as we know, there's not in, in a reproducing population of walleye in Flathead Lake either, although some angler anecdotes have reported that there have been some walleye caught in Flathead Lake. But walleye are popping up all over the place around western Montana because people love them. They're delicious. Walleye Unlimited said that they're not doing it, but people that love walleye are doing it. And there's actually a reward issued for um, any information that leads to the capture of one of these bucket biologists. When I give a talk like this to college students, I tell them that they could pay their tuition if they turn in their cousin or their uncle who's doing it. It's usually done from a pickup truck at night. Yes, a stereotype. All right, so last kind of phase of my talk is about the next potential wave of invaders that I will say outright are not going to get here. Presumably you've heard of zebra and quagga mussels. They are an invasive mussel that comes from Eurasia. They've crossed the Atlantic Ocean. They've been marching their way towards Montana since the 1980s. We've got a whole talk just about them, so this is real kind of 
brief overview. This is what they do to things. They cover everything. They have a thread kind of like a spider web that allows them to glue themselves to things. They'll glue themselves to rocks, docks, boats, trailers, mud, you name it. Um, this is a shopping cart that was in Lake Erie for six months. Just kidding, more like three years, but I like to get, <laughs> I like to get people shocked on that. Um, this is a beach that's covered with nine inches deep of dead mussel shells. If you've ever left, left some seafood in the trash in the garage, it doesn't smell very good, does it? Imagine what that beach smells like. They're also very, very sharp, and they cut people, and they harbor toxins. So you or your dog will cut your feet on what used to be a sandy beach, and then you get infections, and then you have to go to the doctor. So they really decrease our ability to enjoy our shoreline environments in particular. They also eat most of the food. They've been documented to eat 80% of the food in some water bodies. If they're eating 80% of the food, you can actually lose your fish. That's, I said that. There are some lakes in the Midwest where they get the mussels and then they lose their fish. Lake Michigan today, 75% of all the biomass in Lake Michigan is these mussels. So if anyone grew up fishing Lake Michigan 40, 50 years ago, there's 75% less fish because the mussels are monopolizing the food. They live to the bottom of Lake Superior. They can live in Flathead Lake. Flathead Lake gets warm enough. We have enough food for them. We have enough calcium for their shells. They could live here if they were to get here. So we can't let them get here. All right, so I'm sure most of you believe that there is in fact a dinosaur living in Flathead Lake. I do not, personally. I believe in the Flathead Lake monster. I just don't think it's a dinosaur. That is the real Flathead Lake monster. <laughs> if we were to get the mussels into Flathead Lake, it would change the lake irreversibly forever, and uh, we just can't let that happen. All right, so I'm going to quiz you now. So the historic community up here, and then we've got the Kokanee era, and here we've got the mice shrimp, lake trout, uh, lake whitefish era of today. Remember, the size of the icon indicates the abundance of the species. If we were to get the mussels, that's what it would look like. All this discussion about lake trout versus bull trout, redfish, bluefish, who cares what fish. <laughs> if we got the mussels and they ate all the food, we'd be lucky to catch any fish at all. And it would bring us together instead of dividing us. And so we work with a lot of partners, NGOs, tribes in the state, trying to um, Keep the mussels out by raising public, public awareness as boat inspection stations that many of you have probably stopped at. And then we also do early detection monitoring as well, because it's been shown in other states that when the public is aware and they know what to do, they do the right thing. When the public's not aware, they end up spreading things all over the place without even knowing it. We don't want to be the type we'd marry of the, the mussel world. Um, the Columbia River system the Flathead, the Kootenai, and the Clark Fork are the headwaters of the Columbia. The Columbia is the last major watershed in the lower 48 that doesn't have these mussels. So Washington, Oregon are watching very closely what's happening in Montana, because if they get into the headwaters of the Columbia and move downstream, it'll cost billions and billions of dollars in mitigation costs. So, as I mentioned, they're nowhere in the Columbia right now. There have been some detections in the, in the um, Missouri drainage on the other side of the divide, but not on the west side of the divide, not in the um, Clark Fork, Kootenai, or Flathead. In Montana. In Montana. In Missouri. Correct. Um, Canyon Ferry Reservoir and um, Tiber Reservoir on the Marias. Yep. The state has a strong marketing campaign about clean, drain, dry. When you use boats or aquatic recreation gear, you're not supposed to go between water bodies unless things are totally clean, drained, and dry. As I mentioned, public awareness has worked in other states, so we want people to be more aware about this so that they can make the right choices. And then the Biostation has been working with a number of partners, the tribes in the state, um, to do early detection monitoring. We've actually developed um, DNA or environmental DNA detection techniques, we can detect one tenth of one cell by using genetic detection techniques. And we've been using these techniques at about 40 lakes around western Montana for about a decade now. 
We've worked with every partner you can dream of. We've got 30 sites on Flathead Lake that we hit three times a year, collecting these samples and analyzing them. You know, we're looking for the needle in the haystack, and the more you look, the more likely you are to find the needle. And um, finding them early is essential. There are some eradication technologies, but the largest population ever eradicated is about 30 acres. And as I mentioned earlier, Flathead Lake's over 100, 110,000 acres. So if they were widespread and distributed throughout Flathead Lake, there's no known technology to get them. So it's all about not allowing them to get here. But if they do get here, usually you find them near a boat harbor or boat ramp or marina, because that's how they get over land. They travel on our boats. So finding them early does work. So I have a question. Yes. Ah. <sighs> Last time I talked about this, the Float Plain Association of America threatened to sue the Flathead Basin Commission for even coming up with the idea of preventing float planes from going wherever they wanted to. So yes, float planes could be hopping from one water body to another. Water gets into the pontoons, but we've been assured by the float plane community that once you're flying, everything dies. Um, Yes, uh, you should be, one should be decontaminating their boat or completely draining and drying it in between water bodies. And you're right, float planes hop around regularly, sometimes in a single day. So that's something to worry about. Unless you want to talk to the Float Plane Association of America's lawyer who will tell you not to worry about anything that they've got it covered. So, so we can call them when we have an issue, right? Sure, just don't mention my name. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mentioned kind of water fire, water is this great unifier. I have never met someone that wants Flathead Lake to be worse. And so together we can keep this incredible and invaluable resource healthy for us and future generations because it's in our best interest to do so. And that's what I have for you today. I appreciate your time and attention, and I'm happy to answer questions until we're all done. And I'll stay, I'll stay after the program's done as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. So the slot limit on lake trout is basically to perpetuate the trophy fish. Right. Yes, a slot limit is a size of fish that you're supposed to release after you've caught them. And the idea, it's usually kind of a middle to high middle range so that you would release the big ones back there so that they can get bigger and bigger and bigger and people can continue to catch them. Yep. So it's a management tool to select for or against a particular species. The state has had a slot limit for lake trout to enhance those big ones that people like to catch. Yes? So that's a great question. So if you find the DNA, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a reproducing population there. So if you find just the DNA, it means you look harder and you look in more places. If you find the actual creature, then the mitigation technologies that are out there include um, they call them bottom barriers, where you basically put a tarp over the muscle bed to starve and suffocate them. Uh, in some places where it's possible, they put a whole bunch of poison into the water. Uh, an example from Minnesota, they found mussels in one bay of a lake where there was a marina, because that's how they get here on their boats. They curtained that portion of the lake off and dumped a whole bunch of poison into the lake, killed everything in that portion of the lake when they were sure everything was done. They took the curtain away and let the lake mix again, all good. Uh, in reservoirs, they'll actually lower them down so they're dry, so that nothing aquatic can live there. Then they'll fill them back up and start again. Uh, there is a kind of a silver bullet uh, that a biotechnology company from Europe came up with. It's called Zequinox. And they went to, so these mussels are from the Black and Caspian Sea originally. And in the Black and Caspian Sea, um, near Russia and Ukraine. Um, the mussels are just a bit player in the ecosystem. They haven't taken over because there are predators, there are competitors, and there's diseases. So this English biotech company found a disease over there and they've isolated a portion of a virus that um, will knock back the mussels. 
It has, before we go introducing a portion of the virus into our waters, I want to make sure that it only targets the bad species and doesn't spread. Um, but they've started to use it in experiments. They used it in Minnesota, again, a very progressive anti-muscle state. And um, it worked really well, but they found that they had to use a lot of it, and it's really expensive. So it isn't quite cost effective yet. Just today, somebody shared an article with me where a new study is underway where people that grow muscles intentionally, people that are you know, cultivating muscles for food, for economic reasons, they've come up with these little food pellets that have nutrients. They look like the regular muscle food. Muscles are filter feeders, so they're sucking in particles and eating them. And muscle aquacultures come up with these food pellets to help them grow. Well, some scientists in England are now basically inserting toxic salts into those food yes. pellets. And according to what I read today, they only impact the non-native muscles and they don't impact the native muscles. So they're doing some studies on that. So there's a, then there's genetic techniques out there as well. There's a bunch of different research groups, government research groups in the Midwest who are looking at, um, they call it CRISPR technology, where they're able to insert a portion of a gene into a, an organism's larger genetic code. And they can put infertility or like low, low, low fertility genes into the genome of an organism. And that way, when they reproduce, either their kids aren't viable or they have all males or um, they just aren't able to reproduce from genetic, genetic techniques. So these are all the things that are out there, but none of them are in the toolbox yet. Thanks for the question. Many. Dan and I were wondering uh, if there, uh, some of these uh, exotic chef places could come up with a recipe for the muffin trees. What would you do to soften it, right? You have to braise it for days, I think. Yes, sir. Any uh, like sister station relationships around the world, like you know, Lake Baikal or anything like that? Um, our main sister is Lake Tahoe, and they've got a field station on a lake where they do long-term lake research. But there's actually a whole um, community of biological field stations, and there's an organization of biological field stations. There's probably a couple hundred members worldwide. Uh, the oldest field station out there is from Japan. Some monks set it up in the 1600s. So you know, we're excited about 1899, and they kicked our butt with 16-whatever. Um, <laughs> Yep, there's, and different uh, field stations uh, focus on different things. Um, marine stations on the coasts are really big and fancy and have lots of money. Inland stations that work on freshwater dump, but most people have heard of like Woods Hole or Scripps. Those big ocean stations are, are really significant um, entities that do a lot of science. We're kind of, us inland stations, we're kind of like the, uh, the forgotten cousin a lot of times, but that's okay. Back. That Seki disk data that you mentioned in Perry Tahoe, the flathead, available for like whitefish lakes, one lake, surrounding lakes, is, is there a trend in water clarity in the center of the flathead, or is it more similar to Tahoe's trend in terms of clarity in the water? Uh, wish, with Whitefish Lake Institute, um, we recently compiled a long term record for Whitefish Lake, and everything looks good. It's not declining. I personally work with the Swan Lakers and the water clarity of Swan Lake continues to be strong. So it's kind of, it's flathead wide. It's not just the big lake. And that's a great thing, right? Our whole, our whole region is still doing really well. All right, maybe one more question? Or not? Nope, back there. It wouldn't happen immediately, but the, the mussels eat a lot of the food. And so basically over time, the fish would starve and go hungry, or they just wouldn't be able to have as many kids as they did when their bellies were full. So their numbers would decline more slowly than the salmon. The salmon have a different uh, life cycle, that, which is why they dropped off so much. But if the, if the mussels are eating 80% of the 
food, there aren't going to be as many fish after a few years. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tom. That was a great presentation.